Really? <laughs> of course, one guy gets a phone call. <laughs> My name is Court Bollinger. I'm a former Navy SEAL. I did 26 years in the, in the military, 20 of that in SEAL teams. I got done with my second command in the Navy at a SEAL team in a support role and really, really didn't want to fix their stuff. I wanted to break their stuff. Uh, and the commanding officer was more than happy to send me off to training, uh, which started a 20-year adventure of basically going all over the world and having a really great time. I worked with great people in a lot of different places in the world, got to play with all the best toys. Um, through my career, I've worked with an 18-foot mini-sub. I've done a lot of skydiving. I've got 2,600 jumps. I was an instructor there for almost 10 years. Uh, since retirement, I started doing protection on American shipping overseas, being a pirate watch. Uh, that was probably the most boring job I've ever had. Uh, and in between doing that, and I was home being a real estate agent. I'd get a couple of deals in the hopper, and my wife Michelle would see them through escrow, and I'd go back to see again. But in our process, our biggest lead generation is open houses. And a big part of that is how do you say stay safe during an open house? And it really, really, really starts with your mindset as to what kind of person you are and how you're gonna deal with the situation coming up. So, it's situational awareness after that. Your mindset, situational awareness, what are your surroundings, what are your capabilities and limitations, what are you good at, what are you not so good at, and do you know that? And then the tools you use to implement a plan. So, are you an aggressor or are you a defender? Are you the fighter or the survivor? And in that case, the survivor can be both the fighter and the survivor. And is your operating mode fight or flight? When you get to a situation that stresses you out, are you the type that wants to go or the type that stands and fights? Which one do you want to do? Both can win in the situation. It's a question of, what do you want to do? Develop that. In any case, don't be the victim. The victim is the one that loses and ends up in the hospital or dead. Let's bring that back and switch the slide. Okay, the fighter and the defender survive the conflict through a plan. Have a plan. Go into the situation, go into the open house, with a plan of what you're gonna do should a situation arise. Each open house is a little different. Doors are in different places. The parking situation outside is a little different. As you look at approaching an open house, figure out how you're gonna park your car on the street, how you're gonna hold your open house, where you're gonna sit, how you're gonna keep a barrier between you and potential threats. What are the threats? Are you in a good neighborhood? Are you in a bad neighborhood? You develop the plan according to all of this, which is your situation, situational awareness. You have a general, you make a general plan. This is the same, it goes, that general plan can fit to almost any situation you're in and then develop a backup plan or two. Your mindset. If you're a fighter, your tools are the way you think, your body, hand-to-hand -hand combat, hand weapons, and I've brought a couple examples with me. One I usually carry, the Kubaton. It's just a little metal stick. But, and I'll show you later, it's a really easy thing to have in your hand. Nobody really notices it. It's there, it's on your keys, or it's in my pocket, and it's easy to pull out but it's an elbow to the head and come around and I just throw a two inch spike into them. Uh, deadly force. Now, a lot of people don't choose to carry, but it's usually there.
flight. Your mindset, your mind, use your body. It doesn't matter your fitness level. You gotta have enough to get out of the house you're in. Teamwork is a big one. If you're the person that wants to get out of the situation, have somebody there with you. The two of you can distract, can lead each other out, uh, or just plain having two people there doesn't let the situation develop. Communications. Have your phone with you all the time. You can call somebody, have Nile you know, use 911 as a speed dial. And constant vigilance, you're always aware. And that goes for both fight or flight. And again, situational awareness is key. Know the situation and see it developing as it, as it happens. Then use your plan to either de-escalate the situation or get out of the situation. Best survivors, a mix of both. Stand your ground when you need to and get out of the situation before it even develops. Once you got a plan, practice your plan. Think about your plan. Think about when to implement that plan in every situation you're in. You're always thinking about it, constant vigilance. Practice your plan, and this is what we were taught in the military. You've got a plan, you begin to practice your plan until you don't think about your plan anymore. Your plan thinks about you as it develops and kind of kicks you in the head that little voice that shows up going, this isn't right, I need to do something. And you've already got your reaction to that going on in your head. Oh yeah, I need to do something different. Or you're pulling up, you're pulling up in front of the house and the only way to park your car immediately is parallel park between two cars. And that might not work so well take the spot three houses down that you can drive right out of. Don't pull your car in if you're gonna use the driveway of the open house. Don't pull your car in, nose in, back in so you've got a way out. Put a sign in front of it so that nobody parks in front of you on the street. Work your plan, use your plan until it's mastery and you don't think about it. You just do it. Hopefully I can just come up. It's ugly. I, I apologize. It's ugly, but Jason Bourne is situational awareness. And this, this little segment of the movie is an exa excellent example of it. I see the exit sign too. I'm not worried. I can tell you the license plate numbers of all six cars outside. I can tell you that our waitress is left-handed and the guy sitting up at the counter weighs 215 pounds and knows how to handle himself. I know the best place to look for a gun is the cab of the gray truck outside. And at this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Now, why would I know that? Why would he know that? He's got a plan. He's thought about it. And these things automatically come to his mind as he comes into a situation. He's always vigilant, always looking. And Jason's the ultimate example of situational awareness. But at least at some smaller level, we need to be doing that too. Every, every, every situation you come into, even today, Michelle will tell you, I don't like walking into a restaurant or a room and sitting, I usually pick a corner at the back of the room where I can see two exits and I can watch everybody that comes into the room. It's just something that's developed through my training. But I have the situational awareness and I already have a plan to get out of the situation or deal with the situation before it develops. Come on, Jason. Need to get rid of that. Okay. 
again, know your environment. Who's there with you? What are the threats? How are you going to deal with threats if they show up? Uh, what's happening now? And predict what could happen in the future when that next person comes up. Control your environment as much as possible, and, I, and I've talked about that, where you park your car, especially in, in setting up your open house. Try and have a barrier, a physical barrier, a table, something between you and the people coming in. So that if they bum rush the house, if some guy comes in and bum rushes the house, you've got at least a table you can put between you and them to, you know, to at least slow them down while you use the next portion of your plan. Grab your phone, grab your coupon, grab your gun. And again, plan, sub-plans, know your next move. Controlling your environment, and we talked about where you're parking your car. Lead from behind at your property. Whether you're showing houses or doing an open house, clients come in, let your clients in first, I, it, I would love to lead the way into a house with a client, but safety dictates, usually. Uh, I will usually lead the way in the front door, but I'm usually armed and I know I can handle most any threat that's in there. Um, it's kind of a different thing. I'm sorry, put your clients up, make them the fodder, and open the front door in a new place and let them in. <laughs> if, you can't, if you can't handle what's in there, and you never know what's in there, let the clients deal with it, uh, not you. I know, it's, it's, <laughs> but this is self-preservation. Unless, in, unless you're the fighter and you want to get trained to carry and you can lead the way, uh, let the clients be the fodder for the meth head that's sitting in this creepy house in, in the middle of you know the worst neighborhood in the, in the city. Have a plan for the unexpected. And we were just going over that. You never know what's behind that front door. And that continues on as you're going through each house. Lead the way to the hallway. Let them take the lead down the hallway. Tell them what the next door is. Uh, unless you're trained and ready to deal with whatever threat may be behind door number one. Uh, and I usually let clients lead the way through a house. If something happens, my thing is to push them out of the way and deal with the threat. I haven't come across that yet, but who knows, it may happen someday. Do an honest self-assessment. What are you good at? What are your strengths? What's your mindset? Are you going to be the person that wants to run and get out of the situation, or are you going to stand and deal with the threat? Are you a great negotiator? When you sell ice to Eskimos, you might be able to deal with a meth head. Uh, are, you, are you a dominator on hand-to-hand -hand jiu jujitsu? If you're confident there and can handle the threat, then stand and handle the threat. Here's, here's, I'm a big firearms guy. I literally, my firearm is an extension of my hand. It has been for a long time. I'm very confident with it, and I, I know how to use it, but unless you have at least half of that ability with a firearm, don't carry one. Uh, That's kind of how I feel. I got a CCW, but I don't feel confident enough to carry it regularly. Great. I mean, it's just a limited, I mean, the, to qualify for that was not much. I, I realize that, especially in Arizona, there really is no qualification for carrying <laughs> concealed. Right. And that has its dangers and has its luxuries. You can carry, but it does allow some people that probably shouldn't be carrying to be walking around with a weapon. Uh, and the, the second half of my this presentation goes over that. What are your challenges? What don't you do well? And most of us can point those out pretty quickly. Uh, but work towards improving that. Or just know that and develop your plan accordingly. If you're not comfortable with something, practice that a little bit. Again, your example, you've got your concealed carry, but you don't because you're not confident with it. Get to the range a little more. 
some of the tools available, <laughs> like that, your voice is probably the first thing you can use, and making a lot of noise diffuses the situation before it even starts in many cases. Getting on your feet and running at the beginning of a situation, again, can diffuse the situation before it begins. Uh, having a pocket weapon, a pocket knife available, the Kubaton, uh, or concealed carry like I've got. A couple other ones that I found quite useful. I've got a flashlight, a very bright flashlight, uh, but it's also got a very sharp edge around the rim. And it may, yeah, exactly. From, from wherever you bring it up, you can blind a person with it and then poke them in the head. Blind people don't run very fast. Exactly. The other one I've got, and this is my super laser, which I used on ship against pirates because this, this laser will go out 12 miles, no problem. But uh, it shows a very wide beam where I can focus it down to a very... Oh, yeah, to further bright. Yeah. yeah, it gets into a very, very bright beam. It, it, and this will actually hurt eyes. You can blind people with this, this laser. Um, and that's kind of what it's there for, is to not let, they're looking at the light, not seeing you. And of course, hand to hand in the coup baton. Less than lethal, lethal force options. Mace or pepper spray. I don't recommend mace or pepper spray. I've been trained, I can go through a room full of it and cry a little bit, my nose runs, and I might cough a little bit, but I can go work right through it. And anybody hopped up on drugs will have the same reaction. Um, somebody with a lot of adrenaline who's being aggressive, it might not affect them. Uh, and if you hang on to them long enough, they tend to leave. <laughs> um, it's something you need to practice with, and most of those are one-shot Charlies. So it, they're about 10 bucks a piece for the cheap ones. And the more expensive ones, you don't want to use it to practice. So, I, and, and again, they're defeatable. Tasers, the same way, especially the cheaper ones. I can work right through being shocked. Been there, done that. Uh, so most of them have my buddies running from police after a bar fight. Um, <laughs> They're, they're dubiously effective. Uh, and if you're running up against, again, the meth head that's all jacked up on drugs or angel dust, they're gonna be absolutely ineffective. Hand knives, coupons, hand knife. My one thing with this is I have to open it for it to be effective as other, something other than a blunt weapon. The coupon is ready, it's got its sharp point, it's unobtrusive, you can hardly see it, but it's ready to use right away. And it doesn't take a whole lot of practice to know how to use one. My flashlight laser, either way, you can carry those in a pocket and they're always ready. Uh, I think they're very effective in that they blind you, they can't see you. When a person is blinded temporarily, they stop. The first thing you do is stop, and I've, been, I've proven that in practice and combat over and over again. When you blind somebody with a flashlight, they stop because they don't know the situation. They've all of a sudden lost their situational awareness, which opens a door for you to follow your plan and move somewhere else or take control of the situation in a, in a more aggressive manner. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand personal security techniques, they have to be practiced and practiced and practiced to the point where you've got three moves that you do really well and they always work, and you don't have to think about it. But it takes time in the gym, on the mat, to develop that stuff, and most of us don't have that kind of time, or don't want to put that kind of time into it. So unless you're doing that, 
on a regular basis, standing and fighting is probably not an option you want to take. And I highly don't suggest standing your ground when you don't have a plan that you've practiced to the point where you don't think about it anymore. Deadly force. Probably my, f it's just, it's like having a security blanket with you all the time for me. I don't think about it, it's just there. But if the situation ever arises here at home that, that I've got to use it, I have every confidence in myself that I'll be able to deploy it and use it in a manner that can either de-escalate a situation or defend somebody else or myself uh, and not have to worry about where my rounds are going because I'm thinking about it. This situation that, that develops here, the three things with deadly force you need are from the aggressor, the ability to do you bodily harm or kill you. Intent to do so. They're showing some sort of intent. They have a weapon out and pointed at you. Or in some cases, he's got a big knife or he's just a really big guy and he's threatening to kill you. That's enough to be able to use to justify deadly force. And then the opportunity, do they have access to you? Can they get to you? Uh, and then the pyramid is avoid it. If you can get out of the situation, leave, go away, run. Keep the situational awareness and when we talked about that through, threat assessment, can this person hurt me? Can they do what they say they're gonna to do to me? Do they have that ability? Seek assistance. She's got her phone right there. The house phone's right there. She's either already called 911 or has the ability to, but she doesn't have a lot of time in this situation. Uh, action. Obviously she heard the guy come into the house. She grabbed her gun already. She's got on her weapon, she's got a bright, bright flashlight. We talked about that already. So he's blinded, he can't see her. She's got an opportunity, she's got the upper hand. Uh, in the take action, now she's yelling at him, again, using your voice to command the situation. He's got the gun, he has the ability to hurt her, he clearly has the intent, he's broken into her house, he's got a deadly weapon, and he's got the opportunity, he's at the door, He's ready to do some damage. Thing is, she's more ready. She's got the plan, she's followed her plan, she knows the situation. Unfortunately, she was in her room with only one way out. She's trapped, she has one choice at this point. Well, two choices. She can either shoot him or not shoot him, depending upon what he does. If he puts his hands up, puts the weapons down, he might get out of it alive. Second part of this is gun safety. As I said, I'm a big gun guy, and I like to go over just general gun safety. I offer the opportunity for follow-on classes after this, uh, and I've got a flyer for that. Um, but we'll cover quickly general gun safety, how to store a weapon, types of firearms, uh, and in this class I just covered pistols because this is generally Realtor safety and personal carry. Uh, magazines, ammunition, different kinds of sights you can put on your weapon. What to expect on the range, what you need at the range, how to clean your gun, and so on. Always keep your gun pointed in a safe direction. Don't even bring it out if you're not gonna use it. Always keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot something. This is your best safety. A lot of guns out there no longer have manually operated safeties. Uh, they're, they're inherent in the mechanisms of the gun, and the best safety you've got is this one, and never put it on the trigger unless you're pointed at a target that you're ready to kill, including that paper downrange. Um, always keep the gun unloaded until you're ready to use it. This is a big debate. I'm always, I'm always loaded and have one in the pipe, but that's my best safety. My finger's never on the trigger unless I'm ready to use that weapon. Uh, there are lines of thought. Have your gun, magazine loaded, magazine in the gun, 
nothing in the chamber. But then but you have to do this before you... As you bring your gun up, you're going to have to load it. If it jams when you're doing that, now you're into immediate action and you've lost time in the situation. Maybe that second or two that you needed to deal with a threat. Having one loaded in the pipe is all about training, how you train to use your gun. I love this country. We get to carry a gun pretty much in any state in this country except California and New York uh, with very little training. That's the scary part. But we are allowed to do it. And as my quote, I'm Fortunately, it's from Spider-Man. <laughs> um, the, the quote does come from so other sources from history, but it wasn't said quite like this. But with great power comes great responsibility. And I think the school shootings of, of late, uh, where the kids have been getting their weapons from home, unsecured weapons, is a good example of not using great responsibility with your weapons. Have a way to secure your weapons or have them on you within arm's reach pretty much all the time. How do we do that? Have safe storage devices, cable locks to go through pistols that go in the ejection port and out through the end of the gun, and it's a master lock that can't be pulled off. Locking safes, locking cases, uh, and then big gun safes. Uh, the finger safe, it, you know, in your in your drawer that you can get at within seconds, but keep the gun secure. When you're using your gun, both at the range, or you have a situation that's developed, know where your target is, know what's behind your target. Normally during this class, I'll actually bring out a weapon, but in this brand new wonderful classroom. It's got glass walls, and I'm uncomfortable with who might walk past, uh, and I just won't bring a weapon out in this classroom. Um, I think next next time I present this, my wife and son suggested I use an airsoft pistol, and I might do that for this. Um, on the range, always use eye protection. Obviously, ear protection. I can give several examples. I never liked previously to use eye protection on a range, but I've had personal experience lately with uh, ejected rounds coming up and hitting me in the face. Yeah, they're hot. <laughs> yeah. Um, drugs and alcohol don't mix with weapons, obviously. I, I, don't, I can't tell you how many people I, I've heard talk about going out in the desert having a few beers and shooting a bunch of weapons off, but you lose situation, situational awareness when you're altered. It just doesn't work. Um, and know the guns you're shooting. If you don't know a gun, it's not a stupid question to ask, how does this work? Where's the safety? How do I load this? Uh, if, if it jams, how do I get the jam out? Different types of pistols. The Old West revolver, the single action revolver. Now that, that means the hammer has to be pulled back manually before you shoot the weapon. And you see those in a, in a lot of the Old West movies. The, that click as the hammer comes back and then you shoot it, it doesn't advance. It, the, the round advances, the barrel advances, but the hammer doesn't come back when you advance the barrel, the drum. Double action revolver advances the drum and pulls the hammer back for you as the drum advances. So all you got to do is pull the trigger. Uh, or the, act, the, the trigger, the action of pulling the trigger advances the drum after the round goes off. Semi-automatic pistols, a magazine fed, you got a stack of bullets in a holder, and every time you pull the trigger, uh, a round goes down range. 
Now, semi-automatic pistols come in double action and single action also. First round, you pull that trigger back, it cocks the hammer, and every, action, every round after that is only a much lighter pull on the trigger. Um, there, again, different actions, different pistols, know your equipment. Magazines, again, just a vessel to hold bullets. And revolvers, it's the drum. You'll hear, often heard them referred to as clips. Clips are something the military uses to hold a series of bullets together, and that's how you load a magazine. Different ammunition, different guns use different ammunition, different lengths, different circles they call caliber. Uh, so different size round. Um, and all used for different purposes. Even the small ones, like 22s, can kill somebody. You just gotta hit them in the right place. To the very, very large ones, like that, they can kill a moose or turn squirrels into dust. Sights. Um, it's how you aim your weapon and get the bullet to where you want it to go. There are basically three different types. What you'll see most are iron sights, red dot sights, and scopes. The scopes you very rarely see on pistols. Um, and a lot of concealed carries have very, very small versions of this, blade sights that don't have the dots, and they're very, very low profile, so it's easy to pull your concealed weapon out without catching on your sights. And most of those are set up to use lasers. The weapon I'm carrying does have a laser sight on it so that I don't have to line up sights, I just put the red dot where I want the bullet to go. What to expect at the range? Has everybody been to the range yet in this classroom? Okay. So some ranges are more controlled than others. Some will have a range master or coach there that's going to call ready to fire, fire, cease fire. Uh, some ranges have much more restrictive rules on how you can use your weapon, whether you can draw from the holster, whether you have to keep the weapon benched unless you're up and on target. Uh, be familiar with the rules at your particular range. Follow the range commands. If you hear at any range, cease fire, stop, put your weapon down, holster your weapon, and figure out what the range master is gonna tell you next. There may be something downrange that somebody's gotta go get. There may be an injury on the range. In any case, you hear ceasefire for whatever reason on a range, stop firing and figure out what the problem is. I've always got my gun case. I always bring hearing protection. In fact, I got in the, in, in the military, we were using amplified headsets so that we could still hear, but we had hearing protection uh, just in case something happened. Uh, eye protection, obviously. Be very careful with your ammunition. In a situation like this, I carry a 380. A nine millimeter round is almost exactly the same size. And you can load nine millimeter into a 380, but it won't work. And targets. Select your targets for how you want to train. Uh, I use very small three inch circles to do a lot of training with but then you use a big qualification target. Uh, and targets can help you refine marksmanship skills in different ways. But you gotta have one at the range. Clean your gun at the end of each day, at least wipe it out. Uh, dirty guns tend to jam. And even if your gun has just been sitting around for a while, it's always good to pull it out once in a while or if you if you carry daily like I do, it's good once a month to grease it up again, even if you haven't used it. Work the action, make the things move.
Trident Tactical Services is my company, uh, and I do all sorts of firearms training, security work, consulting, and I've got flyers that I'll leave out. Uh, if you're interested in follow-on training in firearms or advanced relay safety hand-to-hand, -hand, we can help you out there. Any questions? Crickets. <laughs> you cover edge weapons? What's that? Do you cover edge weapons? Yes. Now there's one thing about a knife fight. You will always get cut. Always. Yep. Uh, you just go into a knife fight thinking, knowing that you you're going to come out of it with your share. More. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need to do the better share of the cutting, but you go into a knife fight, you're going to come out cut up. Um, it, despite what they show in movies and on TV, there's no winning in a knife fight. My, my best suggestion there is bring a gun to a knife fight. Um, oh, my one favorite course, our boom course. That's where we go out for two hours and shoot at targets that it's blow things up. <laughs> so it's two hours, two hours of firearms and binary explosives that can't be beat. Um, where do you train? Where do you, where is all that at? I've got a range in the East Valley uh, that I do my indoor training with, Ted's range out there. And then I've got a spot out in the desert uh, when we don't have high fire hazards uh, that we can use. And I'm working on a piece of private land with a landowner that we can use also. So, uh, also Clark does training with me as well. That's right, you just mentioned. Um, What's that? Uh, you can as well. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things you didn't mention in your safety, and I know it's not part of your NRA stuff, but having your kids know weapons is probably just, in my opinion, better than a safe, better than any lock you can put on your gun because number one, they'll know not to mess with it. And if they ever come up against one on the ground or whatever out and about, Hopefully they'll walk away, but if they're with a friend that doesn't want to walk away, at least they understand what's happening and maybe can use some common sense through the situation. My kids from an early age know most of the weapons, all, all the weapons we have in our house, and know how to unload and make safe each of those weapons. Uh, they're becoming quite good marksmen in themselves now, but it's all been very controlled. You know, they've had limited access. They're not afraid of the weapons. They know how to use most of the weapons. Um, and I, it's, I've got a program starting at age six with a Cricket 22 single action, bolt action rifle that's about that long. Um, it's a great way to teach basic marksmanship and, and weapon safety with the safest possible weapon. Uh, the one thing I won't do is teach kids younger than 10 on handguns. I, it's just, there's not a maturity level there, I feel, for, for most kids. For muzzle awareness, they just, they're not situationally aware enough to handle a handgun. Uh, but rifles on range, great, perfect. Any questions? In, awesome. your, in your edge weapon class, do you cover Unarmed. Say again? In your edge weapon class, do you cover unarmed? Like if you're if you're being attacked with a weapon, you're unarmed. Yes, that's that's part of it. You okay. come into a situation, you're not armed. Um, or armed, but they or, or unarmed, and they have a, an edge weapon, and you can. Yes, there there are ways to deal with that. Yeah. But again, yeah. Craig, you never get into that, and always bring a gun to a knife fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that concludes this one. Yep. We're potentially working with, um, I think it's VIP, yeah, VIP on doing a range day over here in Scottsdale. If anybody's interested, we'll post it in the group once it's given a date and everything. Uh, they had approached us to get that set up, and we had a few days that we had to take care of. So now we're finally ready. Um, but we're going to be scheduling a, a range day, so if anybody's interested in going and getting some hands-on training.
I'll probably yeah, we'll probably do classroom work here and just walk over the range. Awesome, great. All right. Well, this is, you have to keep time? Yeah, you're done un under an hour. Okay. You've had an hour and a half. That's been bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last one we did, we went over 20 minutes, yeah. so. Because you guys probably have to stand up, right? We did. We, we took out, uh, we had a lot more visual displays, which gotcha. would be nice to have, is where my notes are real pretty. Yeah. However, um, we weren't sure of, well, we weren't sure if it was this room would be a good room to do it in. We had to kind of be a little more familiar with the room. Who opened that? But um, he brought in different types of weapons besides handguns so that, you know, some people just don't want to carry a handgun. So you need better ways to kind of know how you can protect yourself. He brought in a few different guns to show what you don't want for your everyday carry, what you right. do want. Um, you know, uh, an example of a smaller weapon, like I carry, I don't have mine with me today, but I carry a fairly small one when I'm not with yeah, them. And it, it's comfortable. So, you know, it, it's comfortable and it's easy, but, you know, obviously, everybody's got to find the right one for them. I have tended to carry a Glock 43, mm -hmm. um, but I'm a, I'm a martial artist. I've been training eight okay. years. Okay. Um, I'm a Filipino martial artist master. Nice. Um, I specialize in catch weapons. Okay. So that's why I was wondering. I, I'm, I'm definitely not an edged weapon expert, uh, and, and I did not.